In the first lecture, we completed five sections. A, Galilean inertia and uniform motion. B, the Newton-Maxwell equally accelerated field and Einstein's insight that inertial objects subjected to it remain inertial. C, gravity is an example of an equally accelerated field and Einstein's insight, not just that the acceleration is not detectable, but that free fall in a uniform gravitational field is indeed inertial. And D, non-uniform gravitational field. So now let's say we wanted to create some kind of uh, a field equation. So if we were doing gravity, that's a, a very clean, very nice way of thinking about gravity. You have an acceleration field. It doesn't depend on the particles themselves. It's just caused by the matter. If you place an object, a particle, in that field, it will accelerate according to the value of that field. Now that obviously is a vector field because at each point it has a magnitude and it has a direction. So you have a vector field in space. And it tells you also that this is a property of the medium. Gravity, the ordinary gravity that we spoke of earlier and you, you learned kind of in high school, is a vector field that is a property of the space. It's not a property of the particles falling in. It's given rise to by some matter. You have this field in space. And it's a vector field. Now, we've rejected that. We throw away that model. No, gravity is not a vector field in space. It still is a property of the medium. It still is a property of the space. But it's not this vector field. Because what it has to describe are these interesting relative accelerations. So instead of having a vector pointing in a certain direction, we have something that points kind of in a double-edged way, up in both directions like this, up down at the same time, and in. So at every point in space, in every region, what this tidal field tells us is what would, happen, what would happen to neighboring inertial particles. If you put neighboring inertial particles here, they would have these relative accelerations. So that's a complex kind of mathematical entity to describe all that. It's not describing one acceleration in, in a certain direction. It's describing a bunch of different relative accelerations. It's not a unique directionality, so to speak. It's a, and, and that turns out to be a tensor. So the tidal tensor is what describes mathematically all this effect. So now we're, we have a model of gravity that tells us that in the vicinity of matter, there is a tidal effect on the space, and it's described by a tensor. If we want to set up a field equation, we're going to have cause equal effect. So we're going to have something to do with the matter equals the result. And the result would be this tidal tensor. So we can already expect we're going to have some tensor that represents the matter. Of course, we're already expecting, if we know special relativity of matter and energy, and it turns out that energy gives rise to this effect as well. And you can't always distinguish between what is matter energy and there are other aspects as well. We'll see pressure and so on. So you have a tensor created out of all the properties of this stuff, the matter and density and the energy density and the pressure and so on and so forth. And that tensor will equal to something like a tidal tensor. That means in any given frame, however you express this tensor, you'll have this component will equal this component, this component will equal this component, this component is equal to that component on the two sides of the equation. I just want to define a term locally inertial or frames which are locally inertial so it will be local inertial frames and you'll see in some places LIF, LIFs, okay capital L, capital I, capital F. What does that mean? It means exactly what we were talking about when we're in free fall and we have 
clearly relative acceleration, right? So if we're, imagine we're in this room, right? And we don't know whether we are accelerated as a, as a rocket in empty space or whether we are in a gravitational field, right? Now we could determine the answer. We simply let a bunch of objects free in the room. We can see whether there is a slight difference between the direction of the fall. Okay? If there's a slight difference between the direction of the fall, we detect these uh, tidal forces, and then we know it's not a result of acceleration, because if, if, there's, if we're in a rocket that's accelerating up, then everything falls exactly in the same way, in the same straight line. Okay? So, clearly, each particle we say is inertial, but on the other hand, if we're measuring any object, even a particle has structure, but any object that has structure, that means that two edges of it, right, this edge of the object and this edge of the object, are experiencing slightly different accelerations. And this part of the object and this part of the object have slightly different accelerations, so there'll be stresses inside it. So it's going to give away the fact that it's in a gravity situation rather than accelerated. So we define a local inertial frame, meaning if you get to a small enough region where you can claim that this is homogeneous, uniform, like, like as we talk about in high school, 9.8 meters per second square, then it's inertial. Okay, but we, we can see that it's a conceptually deep thing, that it's indistinguishable from inertial, but obviously the larger your frame, the more you're going to be able to determine that in fact there is this relative acceleration and it is gravity rather than an accelerated plate. So to distinguish this, we call them local inertial frames or locally inertial frames. So this is basically Einstein's theory that locally inertial frames exist and that's what gravity is about. What does all this have to do with relativity? Okay. So let's see, does anybody know, that you not know from before, but can anybody figure out based on what we spoke about? You mean like special relativity? Without special relativity. We're ignoring special relativity. Now, special relativity is very, 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 very basic. If you think very deeply into space and time, you come up with special relativity. If you think very deeply into electromagnetism, you come up with special relativity. Any measurement that you make, even the measurements that we're talking about, measuring tidal accelerations, need equipment and machines and, and objects, and objects are made of atoms, and atoms has electromagnetism and other forces, obviously. And in order to make all that work, you need special relativity. So the truth is, at some point, you get to special relativity no matter what. But if we're kind of operating in that post-Galilean, post-Newtonian, post-Galilean, pre-Einstein time. Because everything that we said now would be pretty much comprehensible to a Newtonian physicist. We didn't introduce anything that's not really Newtonian gravity. We just made some radical suggestions. And we came up with this notion of, of gravity as a property of the space, which gives rise to relative accelerations. So now, what does this have to do with relativity? Well, if you think about the indistinguishability that we spoke about that Galileo and others discovered, you have inertial frames that are indistinguishable from each other. So you cannot claim that one is stationary and one is moving at 50 miles an hour and one is moving at 500 miles an hour. All you can see is the relative motion. That's the only thing that could be measured. The one who claims he's stationary measures a relative speed relative to the others, and so do they. They can say that they are saying, if there's no observable phenomenon in an inertial frame, then the one that you say is moving at 500 miles an hour can equally claim to be stationary, and it's you who's moving at 500 miles an hour. So there is no unequivocal uh, determination that one is stationary, one is moving, or how fast you're moving. They're all the same. They're all inertial states. And the only thing that can be measured is the relative motion of these inertial states. Now we go one step further. The idea proposed by Newton and, and expounded on by Maxwell, that if you have an equally accelerating force, so it accelerates everything equally, 
then things will be accelerated, at least as viewed from outside the system, or that's what we're saying, it's an equally accelerated force. So we're, we're supposing that there is acceleration, and yet you cannot measure this acceleration. The only thing that you'd be able to measure would be relative acceleration. So you can call that some kind of Newton-Maxwell relativity. Einstein applied this to gravity, and even though Maxwell actually mentioned gravity as an example, it may be they didn't pursue it further because it's clear that there are these tidal accelerations, and therefore it does seem to be non-inertial. But what Einstein did is he said no, these frames are indistinguishable from inertial frames, and I'm going to say that they are inertial, and the fact that there is this relative acceleration is going to be what gravity is all about. It's not a disproof of the model. It tells you what the model is. There are locally inertial frames, local inertial frames. That's what gravity is. And when you're in free fall, you cannot tell that you're accelerated. The only thing you can find is this relative acceleration. And it's that relative acceleration that is the phenomenon. And that's Einstein's more generalized form of relativity, as opposed to the relativity of Galileo, or as opposed to the relativity of equally accelerated forces, meaning it's a uniform field, and you can't distinguish any kind of acceleration. He was talking about real cases of gravity, where you have equally accelerated forces, but they're different at each place. And therefore, you will observe a relative acceleration. And he was saying, nevertheless, these are individually indistinguishable. And that's a more generalized form of relativity. And there are other ways to arrive at a term general relativity. You can start with special relativity and generalize it. Right, so there, that's not the only meaning to the term general relativity, just like what I said before was not the only meaning to the equivalence principle. Now, one can read in the literature a lot of equivocations about the equivalence principle. Uh, the equivalence principle sometimes is stated as gravity affects all particles or all objects the same way. Um, and, you know, that is true, but it's not true because obviously they're affected in different ways. You know? Or you can say that you can't distinguish gravity in free fall, but it's not true because you see the tidal effect. So I prefer saying the equivalence principle as. what I said the law of gravity is. Inertial particles encountering a region in which there is matter, matter energy, will remain inertial, but there is relative acceleration between them. That's all. So, and obviously, the smaller your frame and the less precise your measurements, the less you're going to be able to detect those, and the more you're going to tend to say that they are inertial. And, and obviously, if you get more and more precise measurements, you're going to find tidal effects, and you will know that you are in a gravitational field. But that doesn't destroy the inertiality of the individual particles. That's the point. The individual particles are inertial. Now, you'll never be able to measure one individual particle. You, you've got to measure to see if there's an inertial force. You have to measure a few particles. And if you're sufficiently accurate, you will. But what we say is the individual particle is inertial each individual part, and the relative acceleration does not destroy that. We have this beautiful model, which is a very radical understanding of gravity, and we would want to find some kind of mathematical basis for it. Now, the next lecture, i um, not sure when it will be, will take everything that we discussed and model it mathematically. And we'll see why we're led to the notion of the existence of a spacetime.
why it has a geometry, what the geometry has to do with all this, and specifically what space-time curvature has to do with all this. Thank you for your attention.